So, um, how do you change the world? Now, you could, if you want to do, do what Putin is doing, or trying to do, and invade another country, in which case you can measure your success in, in territory gained, uh, length of stay, uh, lives lost, coins spent, and so on. Or, or you could do it in Jesus' way, by changing the hearts and minds and attitudes of people, in which case you can measure your success in lives saved. Millions upon millions of lives saved over numerous centuries. This morning, we will concentrate on Jesus' way and the Beatitudes, because part of the key to a better future lies in these eight sayings of Jesus. So let's pray. Lord, give us the grace this morning that we would be both hearers and doers of your word. Amen. Now the first thing to note about the Beatitudes is that they are delivered on a mountain. Verse 1, Jesus, on seeing the crowds, went up to the mountainside, sat down to teach them. Now I have said it before, and I'll keep saying this, when you read about a mountain in the Bible, it's like a klaxon going off. Okay, it's like a big, big siren going off. It's letting you know that something really important and impressive is about to happen. Think the Ten Commandments, think the Transfiguration, and so on. Jesus is on a mountainside, and he is about to say something really, really important. The problem is, for you and me, is this is all very familiar to us, isn't it? Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, and so on and so on, da 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 down the line. But at the time, this was truly radical and revolutionary stuff. They were controversial things. They're counterintuitive. And like a lot of things that Jesus says, they give an alternative to the world's point of view. And the way that Jesus frames each of the Beatitudes in that kind of two sides makes you feel like you're on a seesaw. And it plays with your emotions and your expectations. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Really? Why? Why give it? Why? Because they will inherit, they will be the kingdom of God. Oh, no, that's interesting. Blessed are the meek. Really? Why? They will inherit the earth. Ah, really? And what makes the Beatitudes so special is that each one bring, brings God back to the center of each person's life. And you can see this in all eight of them. But really, really clearly you can see this in the first two. So let's begin. I almost forgot. Sorry. Bit of homework for you this week. Try picking one of these Beatitudes from the list. Maybe not the last one, but we'll come to that one. But try picking one of them and try living it out this week and see how you get on. See what happens. Okay? Good. Yeah, th thank you, Lord. Thank you. Miserable lot over there. A couple of nodding their heads. Oh, don't know about this. Yeah, try it. Give it a go. Let's get on with this then. So, blessed are the poor in spirit. When we are wealthy in spirit, we are full of ourselves, eager to display what we know and how much we can do. When there is no room in the inn, God can do new things with us. When, it's one, when one is poor in heart and mind, one is saying they are emptied, free of clutter, available, roomy, and ready to receive. And for all those who are ready to receive, it's like pressing a reset button on our lives as we re-receive his goodness and his greatness. So this week, are you willing to press that big reset button? 
Blessing number two speaks of mourning. As comforting as this verse is for those who have lost a loved one, and it truly is comforting, it's not really thinking about that kind of mourning. Instead, he has in mind the idea of sinfulness and repentance. This is mourning over the sheer depth of the separation between us and God. But Jesus reminds us that when we turn to him, we will be comforted. Maybe we think that we're undeserving of that love and that maybe he'll reject us. But remember this, he is the one who searches for the lost sheep. And when he finds that sheep, he rejoices. So this week, if you're feeling lost, will you call out to Jesus, that good shepherd? Now, having looked inside of us with these, these Beatitudes, Jesus then turns to the attitudes that people elsewhere can see from us when they look at us. Third one. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You have got to be kidding, Jesus. The meek, they don't get anything but the worthless scraps that are left over at the end. So how come this is here? But then that's not really the meekness that Jesus is talking about. That's like being a doormat. And you know that because we've said that before. Put your hand up if you knew that already. Okay, 90% of you didn't know that. Okay, oh dear, here we go. This is about being something completely different. It has to do with, um, it has to be different because otherwise, why would Jesus call himself meek? He's not a doormat, is he? This is not Jesus, a doormat who walked into the temple and overturned the, the money changers tables, is it? This is not Jesus who was before the Sanhedrin. That's not a doormat. This is not Jesus, the doormat who was in front of Pilate. And Jesus certainly wasn't a doormat when he hung on the cross to pray for you and I. So it has to be something different. This meekness is about strength and humility. Strength under control. It's not about throwing your weight around to get what you deserve. This is about strength and humility needed in order to be a servant of God. Standing for God. Doing the right thing for God. How might that look in your week ahead, at work, in the home, with your friends? And so doing the right thing means being hungry and thirsty for righteousness, or some people will say justice, which brings us to our fourth beatitude. Is there anyone in this church who does not have a desire to see just good things, a desire for a better world. Please don't put your hand up if you think you don't want that. But if you do, can you put your hand up? Oh, good. Who doesn't deserve or desire a better world for our children and our grandchildren? Good. We all agreed. They need a better world. According to Save the Children, about one in six children in the world, that's about 450 million children apparently, are living in conflict zones and poverty zones. And those who live in the co conflict zones, I bet not one of them under the age of 11 knows why someone is trying to kill them. Save the Children have a quote, which I think is worth reflecting on in the week ahead. Every war is against children. Every war is against children. And so protecting the innocent and restoring peace is just one of the many reasons that we keep an armed force. And why today we remember those who have in the past died to keep peace. So this week, perhaps you'll choose this idea to hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice. So what might that look like for you this week? 
So halfway through, I don't like preaching lists. I was saying to Bruce earlier, I don't like preaching lists. It just feels like you're doing a, a countdown. But we are halfway through. We are at blessing number five. Then this one tests your moral fiber. Blessed are the merciful. Now let's be honest, this is a tough one. We often have double standards when it comes to mercy. On the one hand, we like to be shown mercy. Yes? On the other hand, it would not be unusual to want to see others get what they deserve. I'm thinking Matt Hancock at the moment. And it's understandable why we want to hold on tightly to those wrongs done against us. However, by holding on to those wrongs, we're not letting go of God's mercy. You cannot hold on to both. You cannot hold on to the wrong and hold on to God's mercy. It doesn't work. And through Jesus, we have already received mercy. And we know how good it feels to receive that. We have to learn that it feels just as good to practice mercy. And ultimately, mercy will go around. So are we holding on to feelings of being wronged by somebody or something? And if we are, is there anything that we can do about it this week? Our next blessing is directed at the pure in heart, or if you like, those with integrity. One of the finest qualities a person can possess is integrity. Every politician wants it. You know that. They know it's a powerful thing. If people know you are honest, then they will trust what you say and do. But if you're not true to your word, or you're found out to be lying, then the damage done to the organization, a movement, a people, those close to you, yourself, is catastrophic. I used to really, really get wound up, I'm really annoyed when another teacher would be found abusing children and things like that, because it, it just tarred the whole profession. And I imagine Bruce feels the same with his profession, and I imagine you will feel the same in yours, whatever it is, if someone's caught stealing and so on. You know, it just, especially if you thought they were really, really Im impressive people. So it's no wonder that Jesus puts this one into those Beatitudes, integrity. But true integrity starts by focusing on your heart, of, on focusing your heart on Jesus first, and then watch the attitudes change from that. Jesus first, attitudes change because of that. And the need for integrity, to be pure in heart, will draw others to Jesus. So this week, maybe you'd like to consider, are we really true in heart? Are we pure in heart? Or is, is Jesus first in our lives? Or are we doing a really good job of showing it and not practicing it? Number seven. Up to now, it's all been about qualities of personality. But in number seven, he blesses a particular group of people, the peacemakers. Conflict resolution. One word, ah! It's a minefield. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, as they say. Helping people to resolve their differences is hard, it's difficult, it's easy to get wrong. And perhaps not all of us can be peacemakers. But this week, at least let's try not to be peace breakers. Better still, this week, could you point someone to Jesus, the true Prince of Peace? And for doing that, you will be called a son or daughter of God. And that was never said before in the Bible. 
That's how radical that was. The last one. Our eighth and final blessing. This is the one we probably all wish wasn't in the list. Blessed are the persecuted. And yes, you're excused from choosing this one if you want. Having gone from recognizing the need for Jesus in our lives and all the blessings that that brings us, we arrive at this unspoken last question. What is the worst that can happen by following Jesus? What is the worst that can happen? Well, it seems the worst that can happen is you will become persecuted, possibly. But then let's balance that with what is the best that can happen by following Jesus? What is the best thing that can happen by following Jesus? Jesus will rejoice. Rejoice and be glad, he says, for you will be like the prophets of old because you're doing something right. And remarkably and perhaps most importantly, the same blessing that is found in the first Beatitudes is found in the last. We come full circle. No matter what happens from here on in, the kingdom of heaven will always be ours. That's all eight of them. Are you ready to choose? I feel like we ought to have lights going off all over the place, but this one. Let's just recap. All of us here should be able to see why we need to and rely on Jesus. All of us know what it's like to need, to need comfort and care. In Jesus, we know that we are loved beyond measure, so there's no need to be the great I am in life. Only good things can come from yearning for righteousness. So why wouldn't you want to live in a, and work in a world that is kinder to others? Likewise, why wouldn't you want to show mercy when hate just crushes the life out of you? And as for integrity, our very lives should be a witness of that. And, all we, can, and we can all do our best to demonstrate the peace of Christ. And yes, from time to time, some of us, when we stand for Jesus and walk alongside Jesus and will run the risk of being persecuted. But those blessings, look again at what he gives. A kingdom home, here and now and forever, with a king who comforts us and will never desert us, who will never put us to the back of some queue. A world built upon sharing, upon righteousness and justice, upon mercy, and where God will walk alongside us calling us his sons and daughters. These blessings, these beautiful attitudes, are not just good ideas or good in theory. They can change the world. And they are signs of a life belonging to Jesus, who is the one and only hope for this world. So then, which one of these will you choose this week? I'll leave that to you. Amen.